Uh, hello, uh, my name is Tom, Dr. Thomas Cheney. I'm a lecturer in space governance at the Open University and executive director of the Center for Space Bearing Civilization. Uh, the title of my presentation, as, as you can see from the opening slide, is Green Mars, Ecological Imperialism in Science Fiction and Implications for Space Governance. Uh, this is a very much a working paper. Uh, it's an idea that I've been sort of kicking around for about six months now. Um, and so it's, it's still in, in development. And as you'll see from, from when I get to the end, uh, there are quite a few issues that I, I want to continue to develop and explore, um, but I'm thankful for the opportunity uh, to sort of present some preliminary thoughts uh, now, which I, I hope you'll find useful and, and quite interesting. In that sort of vein, I've, I've been limited myself in sort of what I'm looking at. I'm, I'm looking very specifically at the concept of terraforming Mars, um, and, and I've limited myself to a se selection of... Um, science fiction outputs. So we start with Arthur C. Clarke's 1951 The Sands of Mars, uh, which is the sort of the first instance of terraforming uh, in any kind of science fiction. Uh, also looking at the seminal uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, so that's the Red Mars, uh, Blue Mars and Green Mars books, um, which go into quite a lot of detail um, on, on the concepts of terraforming. Uh, also look at the television series The Expanse, which, which, while it doesn't feature terraforming, uh, the uh, terraformed Mars is, is uh, a fairly significant plot point um, uh, or point in, in the series uh, the, behind the motivations of one of the major players, uh, the Martian Colonial uh, Congressional Republic. Finally, uh, I have had a, a brief consideration of a computer game, uh, which is a city building game called Surviving Mars. Uh, which had what as one of their uh, DLCs, a downloadable context, a sort of an expansion pack, uh, Green Mars, which enables the player to begin to terraform Mars. Based on the outline of what I'm going to talk about today, first of all, I'm going to discuss this concept of ecological imperialism, what exactly it is, I'm, or, you know, sort of like what I'm talking about when I use the phrase ecological imperialism, then a, a brief sort of discussion of, of terraforming and the science fiction uh, works that I've just mentioned, uh, then look at some of the quote unquote real world uh, terraforming options. These are things proposed by uh, space activists, uh, space advocates, and, and and other people in the sort of community as to like what what they they envision uh, when they talk about like the reality of ter again in inverted commas reality uh, of terraforming Mars. Um, then I move on to the space governance implications. Sort of thinking about well you know okay this is all very interesting but why why does it matter? Um, which involves not just thinking about what it means in terms of any potential future in humanity in outer space, but also whether it has any sort of uh, implications for us back on Earth. And then I will talk about the, the future work that I am thinking of and have envisioned. So the phrase ecological imperialism derives from Alfred Cosby's book, uh, Ecological Imperialism. Cosby talks about, uh, argues that there is an important ecological component to European imperialism. Uh, he notes that you know, it's not a coincidence that the most successful European settler colonies, what he calls the Neo-Europes, uh, were those temperate areas of the world that have roughly European climates. Uh, these are places in which European crops such as grain and European livestock were able to flourish or at least be economically viable. Um, you know, we can all think of these, these are Eastern Seaboard of the United States, uh, the Cape of South Africa, uh, the, the, the New Zealand um, European style ecology really sort of was able to take hold and, and thrive. Obviously at the expense of indigenous uh, biota, but Grosby refers to a collection of crops, animals and pests uh, that were introduced into uh, these areas of the world as a, a portmandu biota, uh, which he refers to as a, a scaled down, simplified version of the biota of Western Europe. Um, and it was, these were critical to the success of, of European colonists. Uh, however, other scholars have built on this uh, and expanded upon this work, recognizing that the political and economic power has remade global ecology and ecological constraints have profoundly shaped global politics and its economic arrangements. Uh, Corey Ross, for example, says that you know colonialism really does need to be seen as a socio-economic pro project, or better yet, series of projects. He expands ecological imperialism, looking beyond Crosby's New Europe to the tropical world, and conceiving of ecological imperialism more as a process in which Western countries tap huge resource subsidies in other parts of the world as a means of overcoming ecological limits. 
that their own territory place on economic growth and commercial activity. Uh, there are further things, that, especially once, once you start moving into the later 19th century European imperialism and you start to get into sort of a civilizing mission, uh, you see a, a consideration of a duty of Europeans to exert mastery over nature. It's the triumph of man over nature uh, and our Western technology being able to control the unruly um, domains. And that because Europeans have this capability, that therefore uh, automatically uh, not only entitles them to govern uh, these areas of the world, but actually gives them a duty to, to, to govern these areas of the world because where Europeans are able to turn underutilized, empty or defective areas of the earth into productive resource-bearing territories. Uh, and this was a central pillar of modern imperialism. But it's often uh, hugely ecologically destructive uh, consequences, but much, much as the where there's muck makes brass attitudes we saw in, in Victoria and Britain, they took exactly the same, they take exactly the same attitude uh, in the, the colonial regions that the the economic the ecological devastation was sort of proof that it was working um you know and, and as, as ross goes on to say you know human progress was created with a technical mastery of the biophysical environment this is an ideological cornerstone of european empire and it has lived on to today um you know we are still engaging in the same behavior you know whether it's the palm oil plantations that are destroying the rainforest uh, to or the rare earth mineral mines uh, in the eastern Congo, which uh, are necessary for our mobile phones, um, but are causing huge amounts of ecological devastation as well as fueling uh, devastating conflicts. That's ecological imperialism in a nutshell. Um, there's obviously a lot more on the concept, um, but as, as I will show you, uh, these notions per permeate both science fiction and space advocacy. And in fact, the desire for green Mars or terraformed Mars is yet another example of European mastery of nature to liberate humankind from the resource limits of Earth. And it is based on exactly the same ideology and mindset as that was shown of the imperial projects in Africa, Asia, and the Americas, and continues to drive uh, the, the modern rapacious resource-intensive uh, capitalism that we exist in today. So as I said, terraforming is quite a frequent topic in science fiction. Uh, however, mentioned this paper, as mentioned, this paper is focusing solely on terraforming Mars and, and limiting itself in, in what I actually look at. Um, so I, I think to I sort of go through things in more or less chronological order. Uh, okay. Uh, so the first thing to say about the sense of Mars is that Clark's Mars is not our Mars. Clark's Mars is a pre-Mariner Mars, uh, where vegetation and life are still a possibility. Uh, indeed, while the atmosphere in the sands of Mars is not breathable, uh, it is still safe to experience it in a relatively shirt sleeve environment with just an oxygen mask. Um, furthermore, uh, in, in Clark's sands of Mars, we actually have native Martians. Uh, they're sort of kangaroo-like creatures, um, uh, the, as well as lots of plants and stuff. Um, but it does create an interesting dynamic that you don't get uh, in in more modern uh, depictions of terraforming because obviously they, they run with the assumption that there is no native Martian life and even if they do depict native Martian life we're talking about um, single-celled organisms which is generally presumed uh, to be perfectly acceptable to ignore although that's that's something to look at in greater detail at a later date. Um, so you know the Sands of Mars is the first discussion of terraforming in science fiction um, and, and indeed you know Mars in science fiction in general uh, borrows heavily from the ideology of European imperialism. And indeed, this one even perhaps goes slightly further, as given this is one of the few with Martian natives that even in, utilizes the civilizing mission, um, as the, these Martian natives are, are constantly referred to as, well, they've only been surviving in the unoxygenated Martian atmosphere, and therefore by terraforming Mars, uh, humans will be allowing them to thrive in a more oxygen-rich atmosphere. Um, I, and Clark's character, one of Clark's characters even goes so, so far as to say, he, towards the end of the novel, that it is actually humanity's duty to safeguard the interests of these natives, um, which is exactly the same logic behind the setting up of m multitude of uh, Im imperial protectorates. Furthermore, you know, the conquest of nature, particularly of the Martian wilderness, is a theme that runs throughout the book. It's got quite a Wild West type uh, thing about it. Um, and indeed, the, the governor of the settlement declares that we're at war with Mars and all the forces it can bring against us. Cold, lack of water, lack of air, 
Uh, further, Clark describes the expansion of the settlement as representing the conquest of another slice of Mars. As for the why, well, it's clearly expressed that man uh, needs a challenge. Uh, in the long run, man has to uh, has got to explore and master the material universe, or else he'll s simply stagnate on his own world. Uh, terraforming Mars will therefore mean that we've given a new world to mankind. Um, with the exception of the Benite natives in need of uplifting, these themes constantly reappear in science fiction and, and indeed in quote, quote, real world advocacy. So the, the next series of novels, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy, is probably one of the more thoughtful examinations of Martian terraforming. Uh, there is a debate between the Reds, those who want to keep Mars as, a nat as natural as possible, and the Greens, those who want to terraform Mars often as quickly as possible, uh, pervades the three volumes of the series. Uh, there's an interesting potential gen gender prism to look through that as well, uh, given that the, the Reds is led by uh, a woman and, and the um, Greens is led by a man. Um, but that's beyond the scope of this particular paper. Uh, however, uh, the terraformers win. Uh, so despite the thoughtful debate that's given to terraforming the thing, you know, the terraformers win, and, and it's viewed as a necessity. It's the natural outcome. If humans are going to settle Mars, we're going to terraform it, um, because this is the only real way to open the exciting new frontier of Mars. Um, even the leader of the Greens uh, essentially accepts this, even if she doesn't like it. Uh, she says that we'll go on to m and make this a safe place. Roads, cities, new sky, new soil, until it's all some kind of Siberia or Northwest Territories. And Mars will be gone, and we'll be here, and we'll wonder why we feel so empty. Um, interestingly enough, Red Mars also involves discussion of the Outer Space Treaty uh, and the provisions of Article 9, although they get the, the specific article wrong in, in the actual book, and it's not clear whether that's an author's error or meant to be the character's error. Uh, the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty are presented as a barrier to terraforming and therefore must be ignored. Indeed, essentially ignoring the treaty in an Earth-based regime is a theme that reappears in the books. Space law as a barrier to progress is also a theme in real-world debate on these topics. Uh, while more, well more rounded than most presentations, uh, as it does give a full-fledged presentation of the Red Position, Robinson's narrative still depicts the dynamism of a frontier society carving out a civilized space from the wilderness as an engine of innovation and progress. Uh, it is frontier Mars society that develops the political and technological revolutions of the human future, not stagnant, decaying Earth. Indeed, the prospect of the pinnacle of human mastery over nature, terraforming Mars, is even used as a rallying cry for such a revolution. One of the characters, Arcady, proclaims that some of us here can accept terraforming the entire physical reality of this planet without doing a single thing to change ourselves or the way we live. While So moving on to the expanse, uh, which is the sort of the bottom screenshot here, um, and I, I'm looking more at the TV show rather than the books, um, although obviously the TV show is derived from the books. Uh, while terraforming Mars is not a central feature of the show, it is presented as the driving motivation for the Mars Congressional Republic. Uh, sourcing the resources needed to create oceans on Mars dri drives Martian policy in the Belt and the Outer Planets. Mars is presented as a true Turnerian frontier society, uh, innovative and alive, starkly contrasting with the sclerotic Earth society, where welfare and drug dependency is seen as the norm. And it is Mars's goal to turn a lifeless rock into a garden that is presented as the main driver of this innovative and developing society. As the Earth ambassador puts it, it is... Martians still dream. Um, moving on to a completely different sort of uh, genre and indeed medium, uh, Surviving Mars is a video game. It's, as I say, it's essentially a city builder in the same sort of genre as SimCity. However, players in Surviving Mars are tasked with establishing a colony on Mars. In, in an expansion pack called Green Mars, players gain the ability to terraform the planet, developing a breathing atmosphere, liquid water, and plant life. This does not happen with any sort of grand narrative, nor does it necessarily in the player's best interest to pursue, pursue given the resources required to undertake this. Although it does end or significantly reduce many of the game's disasters, such as dust storms. Indeed, the trailers for Agreed Mars do utilize the theme of the value of undertaking impossible projects and conquering nature so as to leave behind its constraints. In this case, the player's vi virtual settlers having to live inside domed enclosures. The, th the theme of conquering Mars was not as prevalent in the base game, Initially, the focus was on the challenge of simply surviving on Mars. But the introduction of terraforming transformed it into a more triumphal, doing the impossible, ma mastering nature motif. Neither the launch trailer for Green Mars declares, we set out to colonize Mars in order to prove it was possible. But what if we looked at the things we believed to be impossible and changed that? What if we no longer thought of Mars as the red planet? 
Terraforming is presented as a true triumph of science and technology, humanity's ultimate triumph over the constraints of nature. We can make, we can make new homes for humanity, which is similar to the real world arguments made in favor of terraforming. So Dr. Robert Zubrin, president of the Mars Society, and the logo is what's been depicted on, on screen, uh, is one of the leading advocates for human presence on Mars, and indeed terraform the planet. He devotes an entire chapter of his 1997 The Case for Mars to Terraforming, and wholeheartedly embraces the Turnerian frontier narrative. Indeed, the epilogue is entitled The Significance of the Martian Frontier and draws a direct link to Turner's speech. Indeed, he describes Turner's frontier idea as a brilliant insight into the basis of American society and the American character. Resuber in the United States needs a frontier in order to remain the vanguard of progress, and as the Western frontier has closed, Mars will have to be it. He even somewhat literally applies the Western analogy, envisioning individual Martian homesteads of two-acre domes. Uh, there is no communal Mars village uh, on, on Mars, on Zubrin's new world. While Zubrin's main focus is the invigorating effect of Martian uh, frontier life, uh, there is a clear thread of the moral necessity of breathing life into Mars. Mars was once a temperate planet, where with enough work it could be made so again, uh, so he argues. Uh, indeed, Zubrin presents terraforming as a natural process. Life and human humans have terraformed Earth since the dawn of life. Therefore, it's only natural, possibly even our duty, to terraform Mars. Uh, he says that a failure to terraform Mars constitutes failure to live up to our human nature and a betrayal of our responsibility as members of the community of life itself. You know, this, this sort of destiny uh, motif uh, continues, as, as does the sort of the need for challenge. Uh, there's similarly uh, another book written by Buzz Aldrin, the Apollo 11 lunar module pile, also focused on the need for a dream or challenge to reinvigorate American leadership in his 2015 mission to Mars. And, and there's similarly, again, there's, there's quite a confluence of human destiny, which is very often uh, very intermodeled with this idea of an American destiny. And oftentimes they, they talk about you know, a human future or a human destiny. Um, but it's very abundantly clear that this is an American future that they are talking about. Um, perhaps every now and then they, they remember uh, to use the word human rather than American. Um, but it, this is a very manifest destiny uh, vision of, of the future. Furthermore, you know, the, the, home, the links to the U.S. Homestead Act are, are, are common reoccurrence. Uh, Aldrin, for example, even has an entire chapter to, called Homesteading the Red Planet. Granted, this is presented as needing to be done for, as an insurance policy for humanity, um, but the, the, the clear sort of links to the, the vision of the American frontier are, are, are just unavoidable. Um, to anybody who even has the, the, the slightest inclination of the understanding of U.S. history. There are some further books, you know, for example, there was a, a TED Talk, uh, again, talking about terraforming um, and a common theme of needing to settle Mars as some sort of insurance policy. Also embraces this notion that exploration and settlement is, is human nature or built into our DNA, generally linking to the, the European age of exploration, but sometimes they try to make a soft to, to a more universal narrative by linking it with you know, the humans who, who left Africa. Uh, furthermore, there's, there's often a, a sort of underlying thing of needing to free ourselves from the resource constraints of Earth by opening up uh, the resources of the solar system. Um, again, a, a common theme in European imperialism of, of being able to access uh, resources beyond uh, Europe. So why, why does this any of this matter? Um, does it just tell us something interesting, for, uh, for, particularly for, for somebody whose research focuses space governance and, and not uh, literature? Culture impacts law. Um, I think that's, that's sort of like one of the big sort of places to start from. Um, I mean, this isn't a particularly revolutionary as a concept. Um, as Stephen Winter has written, we are embodied creatures who exist in time, in culture, and in language. We are socially situated and socially dependent. We are shaped by our culture and our history. Therefore, understanding culture, or, uh, whether it's in books or movies or television or video games, is important for understanding the cultural milieu, milieu which produces law. I think this is particularly relevant for uh, fields like space law, which are so future focused and, and considering you know, sort of somewhat novel and unique problems. Besides the fact, you know, and this is this is relatively anecdotal based on the people I know, like a lot of space lawyers and a lot of people involved in the field read and consume significant quantities of science fiction. Uh, it's often the motivating factor for why, why we got into the field in the first place, making it particularly important for us to understand, you know, the, the where's and, and the why's 
uh, that some of our ideas come from involves understanding the science fiction that we've been consuming. Indeed, it's inevitable that any real-world discussion of terraforming likes the science fiction that depicts it. Um, anytime I talk to people about some of these issues, they are, you know, they will often link, make a connection to some sort of science fiction um, material itself. Um, however, there's also a broader range of activities to take into consideration. Uh, terraforming involves other issues, such as biological contamination, indeed the purpose of human space activities. An example of this is understanding the phrase harmful contamination in Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty. Harmful as a value assessment. Arguably, contamination too is given its dictionary definition of to being rendering something impure through pollution or poison. Uh, its definition is subjective. Harmful to who or what? Uh, in King Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, Sachs Russell releases algae engineered to assist the terraforming process. Uh, for those in favor of terraforming, this is not a harmful contaminant. But of course, it is for those opposed to terraforming. Furthermore, you know, there, there's evidence that the evidence on how much science fiction influences people's thinking is, is kind of limited. Um, but uh, one recent paper on the influence of science fiction on international relations policy, specifically that of the so-called killer robots, um, indicates that those who consume significant quantities of science fiction fans, so therefore a sizable proportion of the people who work in the space industry, for example, are heavily influenced by science fiction. Um, and so if we're constantly reading science fiction materials or watching television shows that present terraforming as, as a natural, helpful process uh, that, you know, uh, on, only weirdo hippies are opposed to, um, then those attitudes are likely to seep into um, how we think about the poli these policy issues as they come up in the real world. Furthermore, there are reasons to be concerned about the mindset that the depiction of terraforming in science fiction uh, and, and its real world advocates displays. And this is beyond any kind of issues that uh, are necessarily relevant to terraforming itself. First, there is the assumption or presumption that terraforming is a natural process for humans to undertake. As Zubrin argues, uh, humans have been terraforming our, our Earth for millennia. Well, if it's natural, then it kind of becomes hard to uh, oppose because, well, this, this is just, this is what we do. This is what life does. Um, you know, we transform the environment into being more useful to us. Um, and uh, assumptions about that kind of, again, go back to the heart of the imperial thing. Well, you know, of course we're going to transform this jungle in, into a, a useful, agriculturally productive land. That's normal. Um, however, I think more importantly is to recognize that ecological imperialism uh, is still ongoing. Uh, the West continues to rely on the ghost acres of the global south in order to sustain our ability to live beyond the resource constraints of our geographies. Further, the recent improvements in technologically advanced countries, whether it's clean air and water, declining CO2 emissions, uh, re forest regrowth, uh, have come at the, the consequence of shifting our dirtiest activities to the global south. You know, clean air in London is a result of the dirty air in Beijing. Um, there, you know, and, and we don't make that recognition enough. For, and to mobilize the rhetoric and rationales of ecological imperialism in order to support terraforming Mars is to support the rationale for this behavior. This will become increasingly relevant as the consequences of the climate emergency increasingly take hold. As Naomi Klein has written, as the corporate quest for natural resources will become more rapacious, more violent, arable land in Africa will continue to be seized to provide food and fuel to wealthier nations, unleashing a new stage of neo-colonial plunder layered on top of the most plundered places on Earth. Um, further, there's a view that geoengineering is a way to deal with the consequences of climate change. Geoengineering is, is sort of basically using the same techniques that, we, that are being proposed to use on Mars uh, on Earth. Um, and in fact, you know, there are a number of space advocates that, are, that argue that Mars can serve as a laboratory for learning how to reverse the effects of climate change, or simply that we can move to Mars, and therefore we don't need to worry about these existential threats to humanity. Putting aside the timeline issues, again to quote Naomi Klein, the far more troubling problem with this approach is that rather than challenging the warped values fueling both disaster denialism and disaster capitalism, it actively reinforces those values. Geoengineering is not a solution to climate change. It is doubling down on exactly the kind of reckless short-term thinking that got us into this mess. Ecological imperialism allowed the West to break free of the constraints of nature, but a way of life based on the promise of infinite growth cannot be protected. The narrative surrounding terraforming, both in science fiction and made by space advocates, perpetuates that myth, central to the Western imperial project, that humans can master nature and overcome natural limitations. Uh, we need to understand how prevalent this idea is and make efforts to combat it. So as I said, this is sort of a first initial foray uh, into a lot of these topics. Uh, there's an awful lot 
of potential for, for future works. Um, I think I want to sort of look at situating this more within in the broader frontier narrative, and there's plenty to work there. Um, I also want to look at space resources, which is what I did my PhD research on, uh, and you know the the sort of this idea of sustainable future and perpetuating our current economic model um, by utilizing space resources uh, and the potential hazards and dangers that, that lie in there. Uh, I also think it's kind of important to define what we mean when we talk about humanity. Um, as I was saying earlier, you know, there is a common conflation between humanity and American, and in fact, in some of these visions, it can be quite explicit. Uh, this is our work that was provided by Blue Origin uh, when Jeff Bezos was talking about building space colonies. That is the United States. Um, and, and for striking for me, and I don't have, I could have put the image up com comparatively, um, but I, I find a, a striking comparison between Jared K. O'Neill's original uh, artwork for uh, a space colony and the artwork provided by Blue Origin. And um, Blue Origins is so much more definitively American uh, that I think that's an interesting development um, that, that is worth looking at. Uh, but also there's, there's ideas about, you know, the relationship between imperialism and conservationism and some of the proposals, again, you know, Jeff Bezos seeming to be the spokesperson for this, um, to turn Earth into some sort of like nature reserve and shift our, all, all our industry um, off world. And then finally, based on sort of my current day job, uh, I think it's, it's kind of interesting to look, you know, astrobiology and the search for life, you know, what, how does science fiction deal with aliens um, you know, what, what can, what do things like the, uh, Star Trek's prime directive, you know, ha have to tell us, um, so there's quite a lot, uh, to do, quite a lot to work on. Um, I, ho I hope you found that the, this was useful and, um, interesting. It's certainly been a fascinating experience, um, d doing the, the research for it, uh, and putting together the paper. So thank you for listening. Uh, once again, I'm Thomas Cheney. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at T H O M Cheney. Um, or just search for, for my name. Uh, always happy to connect with people.